So thank you all for coming. Um, this is really our chance to tell you about a pretty exciting new effort um, that this is the first Maker Faire we're at. And rather than tell you right about that, I want to start with a video that really inspired me. Um, there we go. I want to show you a video that really inspires a lot of my thinking about making. When I play, my brain is inspired by what I'm doing. When I play, my dreams of flying and stuff sort of come true. When I play, I sort of get to know myself better. When you're learning, your brain kind of goes bop, 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 because you keep on thinking more ideas. It's kind of like when you're, when you're learning, you start connecting to different things that you might want to do, like you might want to research that thing, or tell other people about it, kind of spread the news. You're engaged in the conversation that's happening. Sometimes when you're really excited that you're going to get to learn about this one thing that you really want to be learning to, I guess your brain goes into like a state of shock. You're like, you're like yes, finally, I've been waiting for this all year. And you're, and you're just so excited that you don't, you don't care what you're doing during outdoor break or lunch. You're just like, oh, yay, math is coming, science is coming, history is coming. Yes, I can't wait. Your brain sort of clicks into a mode where it's only you and your work, and now and again, a friend or a teacher. You just want to keep going until you're done, and then you want more. The wonder of learning can be like so many different things. It can be a light that goes off in your head, making you get it. Or it can be the click mode, where your brain gets it. It can be questions that you have, or the excitement when you're gonna learn something else. Well, it's kind of like the wonderful of learning. Like how like, wonderful it is of, to like learn different things, or is it like when you're wondering about what you're learning? It's kind of like an excitement and a question. But there again, you can't wait to do it, but you still have a question mark on the other side. Oh, I get it. It's sort of like all the things we said put together in a kapow and like summed up with everything you just learned and lighting up in your brain, putting light on something else, and it finally makes sense. The wonder of learning is like a big puzzle trying to put each little thing that you learn into a big picture. Well, I like to play to learn, and when I'm playing, I don't want to stop. Playing is learning. The wonder of learning is having fun. So this video comes out of the Opal School, which is a school that is in a children's museum. And how can you not smile watching this? How can you not be excited? Play should be learning. Learning should be play. Play should be wonder. Um, and what better place than a Maker Faire? As you walk around outside, even though it's raining, you can't help but see the play and the whimsy that's out there. But behind all that play and whimsy is some serious learning. Um, look at those projects, and though they may look playful, there's a lot of technology that goes into learning how they all work. This is yesterday, this is education day, um, when hundreds of school kids from New York came to Maker Faire. And they did some pretty impressive things. They built circuits, they, they played with different Maker projects, some of which are out there now. But there are a lot of smiles and there's a lot of engagement. And when you talk to particularly the young makers you'll see, you find that they spent countless hours working on their projects. And why? Well, usually it wasn't for a class, it was because it was fun. They wanted to do this. And even maybe more interesting is when you meet older makers out there, ask them what they were like as kids. Uh, most of these makers didn't wait until after they got out of college and after they got out of grad school to start building things. They were the ones building the treehouse that hopefully stood up, maybe not, in the backyard. They were the ones who were taking things apart or putting them back together in creative ways. And so where I come at this from is I'm a mom of a preschooler, and one of the best ways to see how competent kids can be is to look at what little kids can do and to watch them and how engaged they are in the world around them. And we want that wonder. So in addition to being mom, I was previously an engineering professor. I'm on leave from that for the last eight years. And it's amazing how many students I've seen and my colleagues have seen in universities around the country who are engineers to create the new things of the future but haven't actually built things prior to college. And I always say this is sort of like going to conservatory to get your first piano. So how do we change this, right? If you read, how many of you read the Steve Jobs biography? Okay, you probably noticed he was in, the, he was in, the, in his dad's shop machining from an early age. 
Um, I always tell a story of two little boys who grew up with a mom who was the daughter of a carriage maker. And she was very good at math, but she was very good at building things. And she helped her kids build sleds from an early age. And they talked about drag and wind resistance. Um, and you know, they were two little boys. And they grew up, and they worked on bikes. And then they started putting things together in different ways. And maybe they remember that drag and wind resistance learning from when they were younger. Any guesses on who those two little boys grew up to be? Yeah, those of you who flew in, we really probably should be grateful that those kids were building from an early age. And so this, I saw this from an engineering professor, gosh, about a year ago in, in, a, in an engineering education magazine. And this is from an engineering class, I should point out, where they were the A students, but they didn't know how to put together the shelf. And when they did, it was backwards. Right? And so how do we get to this point? If you talk to makers, they've been doing this their whole lives. And I've never met a kid who doesn't want to jump in and build something. You're going to have to pull kids back from the maker tents out there. It's some of us who hold back. So how do we lose that? How do we stop seeing this wonder? Right? This, I saw this statistic, too. It's the only statistic I'm going to give you right now. But 83% of US teenagers said they spent two hours per less, work, less per week working on hands-on projects. 27% said zero time. So where do you learn? It's pretty hard to create something new if you've never built something and never had the chance to create something new or fail at it. And actually, I don't even think it's failure. It's, it's a rough draft. You're trying things. So how do we get more kids to make? Does this matter? Well, I would argue that this really does matter. We have to go back to those little kids at the beginning of this video who saw the chance to, to celebrate their learning, who got to play things, who were out there jumping around because of math class. They were building something. So this is, brings us to making. And really, you know, making encompasses all of these things. I, as I said, I don't think there's anything more whimsical than what you'll see out there if you haven't had a chance to walk around, you know, whether it's breathing fire or it's a bicycle that's a butterfly flapping its wings. This is complicated if you're looking at you know, math and science, but, it, but even teamwork and, and communications pull together to create some things that honestly bring a smile to all our faces. It's play. We work hard when we're playing. Making is personal, though, and this is something that's pretty important. Making is your chance to really show the thing that you're passionate about and you love doing. Every kid, every adult has a in different interest. And we really see making as a way to find your interest and throw yourself into it. As I said, most of those projects aren't out there because someone told them to. Those projects are out there because someone said, oh, you're interested in that? Go for it. Or the, the kid or the adult didn't even bother asking. They really wanted to build that thing. Making, though, is also social. Almost every maker project you see is working together. How do we get kids to enjoy that? These are the questions that we're asking ourselves. Honestly, they want to do it. So how do then we help them? Making is playful, right? Again, it's pretty hard to see most of the projects out there and not smile as you look at them, right? Making is a way of playing. It's learning through playing. And making is empowering. This is a pretty neat story, and I'm going to tell you, because I know some of you in the audience are teachers, and this is a story from a, a, a classroom. This is a fifth grade math class a few years after Hurricane Katrina. And the kids were learning about things like area and things like volume, but their teacher, um, who actually created that video I showed you, Steve Davey, and he's in the Young Maker's Tent, um, he heard them talking about Katrina and being concerned about it. And what can, a, what can an eight-year-old or 10-year-old do to help? Well, they were very curious about shelter. And so these kids, all together, they designed their own shelters. But they had limited materials, and they realized that they wanted to build full-scale. They didn't, a little model wasn't good enough. They were going to build a full-scale shelter. So they did, but they built it for preschoolers, because that was as much material as they had. And so then again, of their own volition, they measured the preschoolers at the school and built this little shelter that all of them had fun working on. But the follow-up story to it that I think is pretty neat is that middle picture on the bottom. A sixth grader saw the fifth graders building these shelters and thought it was quite cool, but also thought that wouldn't it be great if the shelter could get itself to the disaster? This wasn't even in math class. This was a kid who of his own free time in the evenings and afternoon and on weekends built his own prototype of a robotic shelter that could drive itself to the disaster. Again, this wasn't a homework assignment for him. Heck, he wasn't even his math class. But that idea took shape in his head, and there were adults around him who could get the materials and could inspire that and could also really encourage and nurture that. Yeah, talk about empowering. You know, if you're, if you're eight and you're really working on a problem that you care about. Making is about sharing knowledge. This is one of the things that really drew me to the maker community. We spend a lot of time telling kids to not look at each other's papers, and maybe that makes sense in some cases, but really to build a large-scale project, it takes a great effort. I know no great innovation out there that didn't involve help from somebody else. And you'll see through, through online communications, through things like Maker Faire, um, through the open source movement where companies are even sharing their plans, the makers tend to collaborate, makers share. They want to learn from each other. This is, again, about the joy of learning. This is about playing together. Um, so these are some young makers, and you'll actually see some of them in the young maker's tent. 
they've built their own things, but they want to share with each other. They want to show other people how to do it. So to be the question, I was on a panel a few weeks back, and someone said, making looks like a great thing to do, but are they learning anything, and how would you tell? Well, the light, in some of these projects, the light turns on, and assessment is a big issue, and there's great places like NISI who are looking at how you assess things like making, but making creates evidence of learning. If you build a robot and it works, you have to have learned something, right? And you're pretty excited doing it. You know, is that, is that testable? Well, maybe, but really, I should say I came to engineering from actually teaching in art school first. And how do artists show what they've learned? Anyone know? They show it, they show their portfolios, right? So this is something that I would love to talk about people later, is how do we show, let our young makers show what they've done? Well, it probably is a portfolio. It's showing their work, it's sharing, it's coming to a maker fair, it's collaborating and learning from each other, but making is evidence of learning. You've created something tangible, and is that the most powerful thing for all of us, is at the end of creating something, you have a thing that you can show, it's your thing. It's why, even though it's raining out there, there are hundreds of makers who are gonna be there all day today and tomorrow just to show you what they made. So, so where do we make, right? Is this something you schedule a little bit of time in for? Well, making can happen at home. This is the great thing about making. It really encompasses anything where you take your passion and you create something. This can be at home. This can be in museums. I encourage you to go downstairs and see the new makerspace that was open a year ago, a maker fair, um, the NISI makerspace, which is where kids come and create things. Making can happen in schools, right? That math class is just one of many examples. There's panels throughout the weekend in the education cafe of teachers who have really incorporated it into their own classrooms. Um, so I encourage you to come by and talk to them. We're seeing after school programs that are bringing on maker themes as, as something that is this growing in popularity, and camps. This is, I love this picture. This is a camp in, in Comstock, California, uh, Santa Rosa, California, a Boys and Girls Club, and they did a maker camp. And these kids, for multiple hours a day, were creating things. They were building little race cars. They were building things that they wanted to make. They made their own camp t-shirts. Okay. But really, at the end of the day, making can happen anywhere. I really do believe that every child is born a maker. They want to create the world around them. We're only here because we're, we're, we're reaping the benefits of many, many years of makers. Right? Everything was designed and made by someone around us. How do we teach kids to see that they can be those creators? They can create the world, not just consume it. So this leads to my question to all of you, which is how do we best support young makers? And that we really is all of you. Because making can happen in all of these places, and it can take the flavor that the kids you work with want to shake. So how do we bring that to all of them? Um, and so this is exciting because this is the first Maker Fair where I get to really talk more about this new initiative that we announced last May um, at the Bay Area Maker Fair, um, which is a new nonprofit called the Maker Education Initiative founded by Dale Doherty, um, who is the founder of Make and Maker Fair. Um, and our mission is to create more opportunities for young people to make. Because we believe that by making, you do build confidence, you do foster creativity, and you spark interest in many topics, but maybe more important than any topic that you might be working on, you spark an interest in learning, right? Learning things that you're passionate about, learning about things that you really wanna do, um, and really not about waiting for someone to tell you you have to do it, but finding that inner spark that lets you make the world around you. So what are the aspects of that that really are important? Well, in our work um, at the Maker Education Initiative, we really are looking at three things. Um, it's about the people. Buying a soldering iron and putting it out is a great idea. Um, the soldering iron's not that expensive, but it's not the soldering iron that makes makers. Right? It's not about the expensive piece of equipment. You don't need a full lab for this. You start with a screwdriver and duct tape. Making really is about the people, particularly for young makers. Who are the mentors? Who are the peers? Um, and we're really looking at how do we create more makers who want to work with young kids and bring making into their lives. The places, I mentioned briefly that making can happen everywhere, but we're seeing a surge in maker spaces, in communities, in schools, in museums, in libraries. Has anyone followed some of the announcements over the last couple of months of maker spaces and libraries? It seems every time I log in on Twitter, there's a new, there's a new maker space in a library. Because making really is about creating and learning and celebrating together what you can do. It can happen anywhere, and we're seeing more and more libraries putting in formal maker spaces um, where there may actually be you know, a space set aside or pop-up activities that kids can come in and make. And last is the practices. So the practices of making are, the, have you created curricula? Have you created playbooks? You know, uh, many teachers have asked, well, how do I show that this is working? 
Well, other teachers have some created some proof of what's going on, sometimes through stories, uh, sometimes through their ways of assessing. And we'd really love to find a way that we can bring this all together in one place so that all practitioners of making, be it a parent, be it a teacher, be it a university researcher, can find a place to start and find each other. Um, so I don't know if any of you have, have seen our website, but the Maker Education Initiative, so makered.org, um, we're starting to pull all of our information there. And this is where that we part comes in, um, because this isn't about us creating new, new programs. I've never had a bunny in my audience. This is really partially and mostly about all of us finding out what other people are doing. Uh, really, the exciting things that are happening are because a teacher cared or a parent cared and started a club or a class and shared something. So probably, I would say, the most important part of this website is you. Um, and we launched a blog a few weeks ago, and a couple times a week, um, our communications director, who is Steve, who made that delightful video, he shares stories and gets guest bloggers to show what they're doing. Um, and this is where I invite all of you who are working with young makers. I see, some, I see Andrew Carl back there as a blogger. We had a post from him a few days ago. Andrew, correct me, Andrew teaches eighth grade. Correct, Andrew teaches eighth grade and actually has a maker class. And he shared with us what that looks like. Because we've heard from people, well, if I don't have a maker space, can I still do making with my classes? So Andrew actually posted a few days ago um, a video that's a time-lapse video of watching his classroom when they're in their maker class. Everything from setup to what they're working on. And the part that I love about it is it's not a boring video to watch. If, I, if, I, if it was reading time or if it was a test time and I was videotaping it, it probably wouldn't be the most exciting video. But his maker classroom, these kids are running around and sharing with each other and you can actually watch their movement patterns, which was amazing. Um, so I invite you to see these stories. The most exciting thing is that shortly after Andrew posted, someone in his community blogged and said, oh, we're right, or posted a comment. Oh, we're right down the street from you. We're a hackerspace. We do teacher events. You should stop by. Um, so we really want to help programs get the word out about what they're doing and find each other. Um, so I invite all of you to contact me directly and we'll set, we'll set up some more stories. The first big initiative that we have announced this summer is something called Maker Core. And we've heard from so many classrooms and from museums that want to do more making with kids, um, but really want to find people to do it. At the same time, we've also heard from young makers who are growing up and wanting to teach other young makers you know, what they've learned. So we are excited to announce the Maker Core program, which really has as its goal, empowering young adults to become role models and young, to young makers in their communities. And what this is going to look like is in the summer of 2013, 100 young adults um, will be going through a training through us on making and looking at what making looks like in different settings, be it a church basement, be it a library, be it a school, be it a museum. Um, and then armed with knowing each other, which is probably the most important thing, they're going to be embedded in 20 youth serving organizations, museums, um, museums, youth groups, maybe a library, maybe a school district. We're gonna be announcing them soon. Some exciting partners, including NISI, right here. These, these young adults will be basically the makers in residence for a summer, helping expand the reach into the community of maker programs and designing their own programs to share. But probably the neatest part of this is they'll be in communication with each other all around the country the whole summer. So the Maker Corps in Detroit can be telling the Maker Corps in New York what they're working on and learning from the Maker Corps team that might be down in Florida. Um, so we are incredibly excited about this initiative, and I could go on for hours about it and why we're excited. Um, but you can come find us in the Young Makers Tent, and we have information on it. And if you know people we should be working with that would love to have Maker Corps members, please come find us and please tell us. Um, this first cohort, as I said, will be out in 2013, and the projects they'll be working on really have a chance to bring more kids and families the opportunity to make something, but also to, to start building this network nationwide of mentors who are sharing with each other their best practices. And so on that best practices note, the other thing that we are asking your help with is creating a resource directory online. Um, we're gonna launch it in 2013, but we'll, I promise we'll even start the link list now, but you'll have a directory in 2013. Um, and this is really, are you doing research on making? Some of you out there are, I know you. Some of you have created guides, you've created playbooks, other materials for making programs. Let's get them together. Wouldn't it be great to see what other teachers are doing, what other classrooms are doing, other libraries, other parents? Um, and why making the stories of why that making makes a difference. So we will be building this resource directory, and I encourage, again, all of you to share your materials. More, more than anything, we'd love to hear from you. One other thing that we announced last week is, undoubtedly, as we all leave Maker Fair, many of us are asking how we get our kids to make things. I always am. My daughter's coming to her first fair tomorrow. And I know that once she sees everything here, it's going to be, how do I do this at home? How do I do this at home? We're in Minnesota. So how do we find this at home? Well, there is already a directory nationwide um, that the Coalition for Science After School has. And it's of after school um, programs. 
um, thousands of them. And so they, we we're excited to announce that last week they added a making do DIY category to their directory. Um, and anyone who runs an after school, uh, and after school is honestly anything. Um, so you run a summer pro program, you run a weekend program. We encourage you to get in their directory and let us know too and we'll blog about you. But getting in this directory and really building up how many programs are listing themselves in there so the parents can find you. Okay. So I leave, I've oh, left a couple minutes for questions. I really leave you and I want you to think back to that video you saw in the beginning and those kids smiling and those kids playing and those kids doing serious work, but they were laughing while doing it. I don't know, those of you who are teachers have probably learned this trick that you can get people to work much harder if they're laughing and smiling. I tricked my college students into spending like 20 hours a week on a class that was only supposed to be 10. I didn't even ask them to, but they were playing while they were doing it. It was a circus dynamics class. So we did physics, but instead of swinging a pendulum, I just swung them. And you know, it's amazing how much extra time they'll, play, they'll put in when they really love what they're doing. They asked for extra work in some cases. Well, it's the same thing here. When you find these young makers and you talk to them out there, or you talk to the adult makers and ask them why they're doing what they're doing and how many hours they put in, Ask them why they're doing it. They'll probably look at you funny. So why? Well, because I love doing this, because I care about it, because it's something that's personal to me. Right? It's my thing. I want to see if, if I can create it. And I think us, all of us together, the world will be a better place if everyone sees themselves as someone who can create something. All of us, regardless of what you do during the day, regardless of where you go to school, regardless of what you're interested in, we all can make a difference in the world. We all can create something, not just consume things. We all can help other makers. So really, you know, I, I really believe in our mission. It's why here our, our vision is bigger than our name. It's every child is a maker. I've yet to see that kid who doesn't want to jump in and do something. But it's our responsibility as maybe the not so young makers anymore to help those young makers see those opportunities and find those resources and find that community. Um, I want to thank, um, oops. I do want to thank the organizations that have helped us launch this initiative. As I said, for, we're coming on four months, um, and the best part of this job has been hearing about all the great work that's out there. Um, and I see it as our duty to get that word out there and let you share the great work you're doing with young makers. So I encourage all of you to let us know what you're doing. Let us know what we should be working on. Um, what do you see as the opportunities in your community and the places that we can get more kids excited about learning this way? So I think I'll stop and there's a few minutes left if anyone has questions. Yes? Is that video online? Sort of. Um, it's a slightly different version of the one that is. I will see if Steve can post it. But if you just Google Play and Opal School, it's the Opal School, which again I mentioned is an amazing school in a children's museum in Portland, Oregon. Um, it is posted. Any other questions? Yeah, have you seen this in other countries? So it's sort of exciting. I and mean, part of what this grew out of was seeing the mini maker fairs take off. How many of you have heard of mini maker fairs? Great, there were a couple big maker fairs and the people wanted this in their own community. And I think last, last I heard, there were over 60 mini maker fairs planned in communities around the world. They're self-organized, right? They, they, they register, but they're organizing it themselves. And anywhere that there are makers, there are little kids that want to be makers, right? I think everywhere there's little kids that want to be makers. They are makers. So we have, actually, it's, it's quite exciting. Some of the posts that are coming up soon are from France. France. Um, there's some great maker work that I've been contacted about Canada and Mexico. Um, but again, I, I firmly believe that it is everywhere. Um, and we, we are open to the stories and seeing how we can work together as a, as a world. I mean, honestly, I truly believe as a mom, as someone who's taught, it's these kids who are growing up that are, are the ones who are going to make the difference that, that we're all hoping for in the world. So every tool we give them, and what's more powerful than the tool, no pun intended, to know that you can make something. Yes. Do I know of anything? There are some U.S. maker summer camps. I'm, oh, it would have been tough. I have another talk I give that has tons of pictures of adventure pro playgrounds. So I was going to try to bring it up and show, but that's a little too much AV on the fly, I think. Um, but adventure playgrounds, again, really a place you go, and instead of a swing set, you get a hammer, and there's materials, and you see kids building some structures that, you know, probably some of them are a little more stable than others, but they're building their own playground. I know there's a couple, I think there's two or three in California. Um, you see many more in Germany and Europe. 
Um, and if, you're, if, if that's something you're interested in, you may have the contacts. I know a researcher who researches adventure playgrounds, um, a Minnesota grad student, um, and I can put you in touch with her. There is definitely a push to try to get them back uh, in the US. Sure, really making to, to me and to our group is you've created something. If you've made it by retrofitting something else that exists, you've made something. That's just how you made it. So, so and honestly, if you look at many people, kits have been, maker kits, we're seeing lots of makers starting kits. A really great way to get started, sometimes if you're new to something, is to try something someone's already done and build that one and get that one working. If you're a coder, it's like getting someone's code and, and modifying that before you go off on your own. Um, so that, I, I, it's the teaching tool I use with my kids. We'll build this kit, we'll do our own. Um, so, it, yes, and I would say it's all making. Um, yes? Yes, um, so, that, so when we said that big we, we really mean that big we of it's everyone. It's parents, it's teachers. Um, we actually um, have in the, Maker edu in the education cafe that Maker Ed is hosting here at Maker Fair, we've got a program both days, it's over in Young Makers, about every half hour there's a speaker, a panel, or there's actually hands-on workshops, and at four o'clock today there's a, panel, there's a panel of parents from upstate New York, and this is a great idea. They came to Maker Fair, they loved it, and they wanted this at their school, um, and it wasn't at their school. So instead, they found an organization that was doing some maker things. They pulled together a bunch of parents, like the kids, I think they're up to 60 this year, and they did it at their houses, and they had someone coming in and teaching them making. And then they worked with their school district, and they got it into the schools, and it was really parent-driven. Um, so I encourage you to come and hear that story at 4 o'clock. Um, but parents are a big part of it, and when you sign up, there's actually a register as a parent part of it on our website to get our newsletters. Um, I would love to hear from parents about how we can help. I will also say that there is a parent panel tomorrow morning of four parents who are parents of young makers. Um, and I believe it's at 11, but you should check that. And you know, this sounds great, but there are some challenges to being a parent of young makers. Um, and you know, how do you help them through things? What are some of the struggles? Where do you find the resources in your community? I encourage you to come and hear those parents talking. They come from very different, they're four different states. Um, and very different informal, starting your own program, finding another program, having your kid do it in the basement by themselves, doing it with them. You'll hear all those different models. And I think we're, we're done. So I encourage you all to stop by the, the Young Makers tent. Um, and I look forward to hearing your stories. Thank you all.